I think most of you know that our country was founded, uh, declared its independence on July 4th, 1776. But that was kind of like the conception of the nation. There was a gestation period that took place over the next seven years because it wasn't until 1783 that we won the war of our independence and actually became a nation. And uh, so we, we had this period of uh, like seven years of fighting, fighting for our freedom. My topic today is great boldness. That was a pretty bold thing to do, to go up against the greatest power on the planet, the British Empire, and say, hey, we're going to do our own thing and uh, not expect some consequences. Very bold. And during that period of war, there's one hero, and I want to put his picture up there. Some of you may recognize him, and some of you may not. Uh, he's a war hero, and, and, and this war hero in the year 1779, the war was underway. The British were taking advantage of us, and we had a continental uh, navy. And the continental navy was uh, quite small compared to the imperial power of the British Empire. And uh, this particular man has become the greatest naval hero, perhaps, of all American history. Uh, he was going up in 1779. He, he was accused of the, of the British of being a, 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 a pirate because they did not acknowledge America as its own sovereign country. It was part of the British Empire trying to break away. And so they considered him just a pirate. But this pirate has actually decided to take the war to England. And so he had taken a small fleet across the Atlantic and was attacking the coastline of England, stopping, attack, pull away. He wanted them to feel what it was like to have their nation under siege. And it was quite effective. He made his way around the, the British island. He was in the, the North Sea. And it was a September evening, I believe it was September 22nd, 1779, that uh, the battle took place. They spotted each other about noon, but because they are ships powered by wind, and there wasn't a very strong wind that day, it took them hours to come within range to even know who the other one was. Of course, this general representing the Americans was flying a false flag, as so were the British. The British had a merchant fleet, and their man of war ship was flying a false flag as well as one of the merchants, and they had, had these, and by the time the general saw, the American, not general, captain, the American captain saw who it was, he was on pursuit. There were two other ships with him, at least there had been more, but because they had already had some battles and captured some other ships, they sent those ships back as booty to America to be retrofitted for war. And so in the, the North Sea, about noon, they spot each other, and now the, the ships are merging towards one another because they know there's going to be a conflict. The conflict doesn't start till about 8 o'clock. The other captain is uh, the British captain, uh, uh, Pearson, and he is a, a captain of a ship called the Serapis. And the Serapis is a man of war ship. It outguns the other ship called the Monhammer Shard, by at least a dozen or more guns. It really outnumbers the American ship by 18 pounders. Now, that doesn't sound like much to us, but I believe that's the weight of the cannonball it's shooting. The 18 pounders, we had three, they had dozens. It's a man of war ship with several levels of guns and we're just a retrofitted merchant ship that has been changed over into a warship, and so we are mismatched by the latest, greatest, fastest British ship and an old merchant ship that's converted for war. In fact, it's got three 12-pounders on the deck. They were made in France, which was known for making poor quality cannons, of which the first one that they fired, because they don't practice, because Americans don't have enough money to use practice shells, the first one they, they actually do in battle explodes, rendering the others inoperable. We are at a real disadvantage. 
So it's about 8 o'clock when uh, the war, actually, the battle between these two ships begins. And uh, the, the, at 8 o'clock, uh, they're close enough where they call out, who are you? And they're naming who they are as false ships. Okay. The British are especially wanting to know who it is. And uh, so one of the, uh, uh, the, the Marines on deck gets a little edgy and mistakenly fires his musket. As soon as that fire was shot, all the 18-pounders on the upper deck uh, of the Serapis fire over at the America Bahama Richard, and they devastate it. I mean, the battle has begun. The Americans are already at a disadvantage. This battle goes on and on and on. In fact, the battle's going to last four hours. There's maneuvers by our captain and trying to, to get the ship uh, at an advantage. He wants to be able to capture the win because if he can capture the win, he can control the ship. The other ship ha is bigger and faster. So he's got to get in position so he robs the wind from the Serapis so that he can slow them down. He also aims his cannons that he has, his 12-pounders and 9-pounders, at the main mass. Because if he can knock down the main mass, then he'll be able to take them out of the, the advantage on speed. And so this battle is raging. Both sides are firing. And, and the British are just pounding the Bonhammer Shard. They're just pounding the daylights out of it. It gets so bad at some points in the battle that the cannonballs go completely through the ship without hitting anything. From one side all the way through the other, just going right through. Fires break out on both sides. And so, is there like a ceasefire? When the, the fire breaks out on the ships, all the people who are manning the guns are now working to put out their fires. And so there's a little quiet spell on the waters as it darkens in the night. Crowds on the shores because the, there's, the, the sea is still. There's virtually no wind. And so crowds are gathering because they can see the flames of the ships out in the harbor. The other supporting ships in the, uh, with the Bonham Richard, the Alliance and the other, the Vengeance, they had slipped away to chase some other ships. And, and the one, the Alliance, just held back far enough because he didn't want to go against the Man of War ship. There could have been two Americans against one, but he's lingering back. By the time he joins, there's so much smoke in the air that the Alliance is firing not on the Serapis, but on the Bonham Richard. He's firing on our own ship. It is so dreadfully bad. There's a point in the battle in which they, the second, third in command, the, 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 under, under the captain, they think the captain has, has, is lost. And so they call for quarters. And this is so important. That's a, say, hey, we want to come to quarters for we can have terms of surrender. Now, I have to admit, at the, I left a part out that's really important. At the beginning of the battle, Captain Pearson, realizing who the enemy was and was a pirate, a famous pirate in his, his eyes, went out and d deliberately nailed the Union Jack to the flag staff so that sending a signal to the Americans, we will not surrender. Well, the Americans are so beat up at this point in the battle. There's smoke, there's flames, uh, the cannons have burst, half of his crew has been wounded or, or dead. And, <clears throat> but Jones implemented a strategy in battle that was like God sent. He ordered his marines and some of his sailors to climb up the masts and get out on the riggings with their muskets, with knives, with clubs, and with grenades. And they've been up there shooting down on the British, clearing the deck so much so that none of the British could actually come up on deck. They had already smashed side to side. They would put grappling hooks, tried to, to, to board the, the British ship, but they were beaten off, so they had to clear the deck. And in clearing the deck, there was a, a, a man by the name of William Hamilton, who is a sailor who climbed out on the deck with a bucket of grenades. Now, the grenades back then weren't like the grenades today. They're big round balls about the size of a softball with a wick that came out of it. He's got a bucket, and he pulls out one of these softball-sized grenades. He lights it, 
and he lobs it what he hopes will go actually through the decking and down below. And miraculously, it does. The British in the middle of the battle and putting out fires and everything had not really secured their ammo supply for the, the ship's second deck. And it ignites and it blows up. It wipes out like half the men on that level. By this time, there's eight feet of water in the hold where they were holding previously caught prisoners on the American ship, the Bonhomme Richard, and they're down in the hold and they're begging to be released lest they drown. And finally the American captain says, release them. And, and they're released out of, the, out of their, their would-be grave from drowning. Some of them come up and decide that was such a measure of mercy to join the Americans fighting the British, their own, own side. Others are so stunned they do nothing at all. With that big explosion that ripped through the, the Serapis, the Captain Pearson decides that he's got to surrender and he calls for quarters. He calls to strike. So he personally has to climb out and rip down the flag that he had put up, and he surrenders. But just before that, there was this very tense time in the battle when he had asked, do you surrender? Do you strike? And the captain of the ship, John Paul Jones, says, boldly, I have not yet begun to fight. I will sink before I will strike. Talk about boldness. The battle went on for those four hours. At the end of the battle, John Paul Jones invites the Captain Pearson in order to go into the quarters, and he accepts the sword of surrender, and then he invites him to a glass of wine. The next day, as hard as they tried, with manning pumps to get the water out of the hold of the ship, the Bonham Richard sinks to the bottom of the sea. John Paul Jones has to take the ship that he so boldly won to the, the Dutch, uh, Colin, uh, the, the, the Dutch uh, uh, Holland area in order to refurbish it so he can sail home. Wow. Talk about boldness. I have not yet begun to fight. <laughs> they, were, they were defeated. When Captain Pearson actually went on to the Bonham Richard, he could not believe how devastated the ship was. He was actually impressed that his man of war could do so much, so much damage. But he was equally impressed that the Americans, one of the questions he wanted to know, how many of the sailors were actually Americans? And I thought it was because he wanted to know how these inferiors could beat him, but it was really, he didn't want it to have been the French because the Americans had gotten the Monham Richard from the French and he would rather be defeated by the Americans than by the French. And so he wanted, and of the 380 men aboard, 300 were Americans. And so he was glad that he got beat by a cousin to the empire of the Roman, uh, to the uh, British empire and not by the French. Wow, what a story. Great boldness. There are some sailors in the Bible who have what I call mega boldness, just like John Paul Jones had this mega boldness. I mean, this is a boldness. When you are totally defeated, to say I've not yet begun to fight, against an, an army far, or a navy far superior to yourself. These sailors are... Peter and John. Well, I know they're not naval sailors, but they were fishermen, and they had fishing boats, and they had sails, so I guess that technically makes them sailors. And they had mega boldness, and I want to talk about their mega boldness today. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says, when, when the leaders in Israel saw their courage, and I checked it out, the word courage is actually boldness. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they saw their boldness. Later in the text, they pray that they might have great boldness. Now, the word great is actually in Greek. It's translated from the word mega. 
And that's where we get the concept of mega in our culture today. It's something that's really, truly great. They, they prayed for great boldness. And by the end of the message today, I think we're going to ask ourselves, God, we're going to pray, God, give me great boldness. Great boldness. Now, the setting is they are not at sea. Not, I told you this whole story about being at sea, but they were not at sea at the time. In fact, the setting is they are going into the temple at the time of prayer through the beautiful gate and as they had done countless times before. And sitting at the gate is a man who has been lame his whole life. And he, his whole life, we're not told how old he is, but he's been lame. And so I imagine many times Jesus and the disciples pass by this guy sitting along the side on the way in the beautiful gate. There he is begging. And as they're going through... Peter and John both locked their eyes on the man who is lame, who's been begging. They've probably seen him here many times before when they passed through. And they lock their eyes on him, and they look at the man, and the man is begging for money, and he asks for some alms, and Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. But what I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, this is what I give you, walk. Then he reached out, took him by the hand, and he helped him up, and he jumped to his feet. I love that. Did you like that? And began to walk. This is the setting. What would we call this? We would call this the miraculous. The miraculous. The miraculous. Now, I jump into the next chapter, all the way down towards the end of the chapter, in the 29th verse, it says, they're praying, now, Lord, consider their threats. I want to talk about the threats, their threats. It wasn't like somebody stuck them up with a gun and said, okay, give me your dough. So I got to ask, who, who is threatening them? The question is, who is threatening? When I jump to chapter 4, verse 1, it tells me the priest and the captain of the temple guard who were there in the temple when Peter and John walked through and they reached out, and they gave him a right hand, and he jumped up, and he started walking. They were there to witness this. When the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to Peter and John, and while they were speaking to the people, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. If you know Jesus, you'll be resurrected from the dead. Whoa. Whoa. To prove their message of what they were proclaiming, they did a miracle, because the miracle wasn't just about the man because he was suffering. He'd been there all those years. Jesus had probably even passed by before that. Healing him wasn't about just making him well. Healing him was to say, if we can do that, Jesus, that we're preaching in his name, this message will bring the resurrection that you need should you die. It's a verification of what was going on. Well, they seized Peter and John because it was evening, and they put, him, put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message that day that he was preaching in the court when they seized him, the number of them grew. They believed, and, and the number of them grew to about 5,000. Now, you've got to realize, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people accepted the Lord, were baptized, and the church was begun. This is telling me another 2,000 accepted the Lord on this day that they were there preaching. God was at work in the church because of these men's boldness. Now let's continue in the story. The religious elite were also against them. The next day, the rulers, the elders, the teachers of the law in Jerusalem, Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, who was the former high priest, and John, Alexander, and other men of high priestly family, they were all threatening these early apostles because of what they had done and what they were preaching, what they were preaching. They had Peter and John brought before them and they began to question them by what power or what name did you do this? What power? There's power in the name of Jesus. I noticed that in the, the, the book of Acts, they never talk about a God thing. Oh, that was a God thing. You ever hear somebody say that? Something incredible happened. Oh, that was a God thing. 
They always credit Jesus. It's a Jesus thing. Jesus is at work. What happened here? This healing of this man, the power was from Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus. So they're asked, by what power and what name did you do this? They're actually wanting them to say something that they can call blasphemy, and then they can incarcerate them even longer and eventually crucify them just like they did Jesus. Remember, they accused him, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up again. They accused him of blasphemy against the temple of God, and they crucified the Lord of glory. They're looking for a reason. So why did they threaten him, really? What was the reason here? It's because of the miracle. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, the Holy Spirit took control of Peter, and he speaks out to them, the rulers and the elders of the people, if we, be, if we are being called an account today for an act of kindness showing to a cripple and ask how he was healed. Listen, he said, you're calling us on the carpet because we healed a man and you don't have anything that you can say to refute it. <laughs> we gotcha. We gotcha. It's because of the name in which we did this? Okay, the power was the miracle. Here's the name. Then he says, then know this. And you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We want to be very specific who this is. The name Jesus in Hebrew is, jo is Joshua. You know there are a lot of kids running around with the name of Joshua? Yeah. So when he says Joshua, the Christ, okay, Joshua the Christ, he's saying, uh, I want you to, so the Christ, the guy you just crucified, uh, the one who came from Nazareth, you know, the north, and you thought that nothing good comes out of Nazareth. He said, listen, it is this Jesus whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This man stands before you healed. It's because of his name, his power, his resurrection that this man has, is standing before you. Whoa. It's obvious he was right there in the midst. Then he gets really bold. Peter starts quoting scripture to all these religious elite. He says, the stone, Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone you builders rejected, Christ is the stone, has become the capstone, the most important stone of all. And then we have this wonderful verse. Salvation is found in no one else. Listen, folks, there's no other way to be saved. No one else can save you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The early Christians, before they were called Christians, were called people of the way because they knew that Jesus was the only way. It's not Buddha. It's no one else. It's just Jesus. He says, salvation is found no one else, no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. We're talking about being saved from your sins and the consequences of death, for the wages of sin is death. And he's saying, the only way you can be saved from eternal damnation and hell, the only way you can be saved is through Jesus Christ. And you've rejected him. And you've rejected him. Well, the reaction to this great boldness, you've got to realize, Peter is bold. He's already been incarcerated. He's standing there giving an account uh, for his stand. And their reaction to him is interesting. When they saw the courage, oh, that word courage, I already showed you before, that word is boldness. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they realized that John and Peter were unschooled. They hadn't gone to a synagogue. They hadn't gone to the synagogue school and the training. They, they were fishermen. These guys were fishermen. They weren't trained in seminary. They hadn't gone to Bible college. There's none of that. When they realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. You want to know what's more important than going to Bible college? What's more important than going to seminary? Spend some time with Jesus. How do you do that? 
Well, in their case, they were with him 24-7. They lived with him. They listened to him, every word he said. How do I listen to him today? I get into the book. Jesus speaks through that book. I read and I say, Lord, speak to me, for your servant is here, ready to listen. I spend time with Jesus in the Word. I spend time with Jesus in prayer. I pray my prayer to Him. And when I wrap my prayer up, I say, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior, amen. <laughs> Why do I do that? Because the name of Jesus is powerful. It's exactly what the book of Acts is saying. When they saw the boldness and that these men had been with Jesus, here's what they, their reaction. It says, but since they could not, because they could see the man who had been healed, he was standing there with Peter and John, the man who'd just been healed. The guy had been jumping and dancing and he's walking, and they, for years they'd passed him by. And, and maybe the, the generous ones would even take out you know, a, a shekel and give it to him, or an alm or something, and give it to him out of compassion for him. Now they see him standing there and they know for year upon year upon year upon year he was there. How could they argue with that? There was nothing they could say. People say, well, how do I share my faith? You just tell them what Jesus has done for you. They say, but what they'll say, they don't believe in God. You'll say, well, that's too bad. I do. Let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. And you tell them how you got saved. You see, there's one thing they cannot argue with. They cannot argue with the fact of your salvation. Only you know that the Lord has saved you. No one can tell me that I didn't get saved at eight years old. Well, yes, I did. Let me tell you how I got saved. And I tell them how I accepted Jesus Christ as an eight-year-old boy. I placed my faith in him. At 12 years old, I got baptized to be a follower of Jesus. At 16, I rededicated my life to him and, and accepted the call to ministry you can't argue with that. That's my story. Here, how could they argue with this man's story? For years I was lame and now I walk. And so Peter is emboldened, the man is emboldened, and what are they going to do? The Sanhedrin, that is a ruling body in Israel, then conferred together. Come on, guys, we've got to do something. And then they came out and they commanded Peter and John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. There is a new culture that has just been established, and it is the culture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the church. It is a Christian culture, and the first thing the Christian culture is, is hit with is cancel it. <laughs> Come on, folks, nothing is new under the sun. It's been around forever. Stop preaching. and It's contrary to what we believe, so we're going to stop what you are teaching and preaching. <clears throat> we're going to shut you down. Cancel the Christian culture. Cancel it. <clears throat> now we come to the assertion of Peter at this point. Trying to cancel this new Christian culture of resurrection, theology, and Jesus Christ as the Christ, and that salvation is in him alone, and they want to they Shut that down so that you have to become a slave to the law and all their rules and regulations and do everything their way. But Peter and John replied, you judge for yourself whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. Hmm. Which is right? Even they would have to say you obey God rather than man. Then he has this. Here's the boldness. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I don't know, maybe the day will come when they tell me to quit preaching. And I'll have to say, just like Peter, you can, I cannot help speaking about what I know of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done. That's John Paul Jones. Buddy, I have not yet begun to fight this preacher is going to keep on preaching. The more you resist it, the more I'm preaching. Because I'm going to obey God, not man. This is boldness, boldness, boldness. So they released them, and on their way back, on the release, Peter and John went back to their own people. At this point, they're not even called church. They're people of the way. They're following Jesus, but it's the church. They go back to the church there in Jerusalem. Now they're about 5,000 strong, and they reported all 
that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. What do they say? Stop preaching. What are they going to do? Not stop preaching. They're going to keep preaching. They're going to keep teaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he is alive, and that he will save you if you put your faith in him and him alone. And when they had heard this, when they is the church, when the church heard this, they raised their voice together in prayer to God. And here's what they prayed. Sovereign Lord, you made heaven and earth. You are the creator. Why would I worry about the Sanhedrin? Why would I worry about a little thing like the Roman government? <laughs> Largest empire on the planet at the time. Why would I worry about anything like that? You are the creator. You created heaven and earth, the seas and everything in them. Everything belongs to you. They pray and they acknowledge who God is. Then they pray and say, oh, God, you spoke. I think this is the most important thing in the whole of the Bible. God could have created us and just left us on our merry way, but God, not only did he create us, he spoke to us. He wants a relationship with us. He said, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Psalm 2, and he quotes it. Oh, here he is, in his prayer, quoting scripture. Why do the nations rage? What nations? The Roman Empire. And the people's plot in vain. What people? The Jewish people plotted in vain to kill the cruc and crucify the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ. He's quoting from the psalm. He's saying, And the kings of the earth have taken their stands and the rulers together against the Lord and against his anointed. They crucified Jesus with a sign above his head. King of the Jews, they knew who he was. The Lord's anointed. And then in his prayer... He applies what was written in Psalm 2 by David to what was going on right then and there and now. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate. Whoa, now he is identifying the political figures of the nations. Herod and Pontius Pilate met with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Oh, that's the, the, the Jews as well in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Wow. He takes the ancient scriptures and he applies it in his prayer to what was going on right then. He applies the word of God. We have to. That book wasn't written <clears throat> for, a, for them back then because they lived it. It was written for us right now to apply it to our lives. And he prays the scripture back to the Lord. And then he adds, they did what your power and your will had declared before should happen. <laughs> I, I like the King James. They did whatever your hand and your purpose de determined before to be done. He said, you know what? They with their own wicked hands crucified the Lord of glory. But it was in your plan all along. It was in your plan that Jesus would die for our sins, he would be buried, he'd be raised again, that we could have our salvation, but yet they were accountable because with their own wicked hands they did it to Christ. And he's, he's acknowledging, God, you are sovereign, Lord God, in control of everything. And the same is true this very day. The Lord is in control of everything. So here's their prayer request. Work our all the way down. Now, Lord, consider their threats. They're trying to cancel us, Lord. They're opposing us. And enable your servant to speak your word with greatness. Enable your servants to speak the word with great boldness. There it is, mega boldness. Mega boldness. Like John Paul Jones, he's defeated. His ship is going down. He's got eight feet of water in the hole, and, and there's actually cannonball holes in the side of the ship that are now below water. So it's just pouring in. It's just pouring in. And he said, I have not yet begun to fight. And, and here, these apostles are in a culture that is so against them. And he's saying, give us more boldness to speak. He doesn't ask for his, them to be destroyed. He doesn't ask God to take them away. He says, God, make me more bold. 
Work on me. Don't work on my culture. Work on me. Make me the bold one to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and salvation in him. Stretch out your hand to heal. I love that. How did this whole controversy start? <laughs> they healed the man. So stretch out your hand. Do more of this, Lord. Do what you're doing. Just keep going. Keep it up, Lord. And perform miraculous. Whoa. Remember last week we talked about this? Miracles. The word miracle means, it comes from the word dunamis, means powerful. <clears throat> we get the word dynamite. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous, dynamite, powerful signs. But I want to back up to that word dynamite. The word there that is dunamis in the Greek doesn't even occur in this passage, but our translators have added it so you know that he's not talking just about a sign, but the healing was a powerful work of God. It was dynamite, the healing. So we have this dynamic healing, but it's done as a sign. It is saying something. He healed the man so that they would know what they were preaching was true, that Jesus the Christ can save you from your sins. It's the only reason he healed the man. And the wonders, it gets that, wow! Remember what it said? 2,000 people believed that day. They said, wow, this is true. He was healed because Jesus is resurrected. I'm going to believe in Jesus, the resurrected one. The sign pointed to Jesus. They said, wow. But not all say, wow. Uh, some say, we've got to get rid of these Christians. And that's exactly what the leaders, it gets a response, always gets a response. He says here, they perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And it worked. After they prayed, notice that? As soon as they got done praying, the place where they were meeting was shaken. I just wish that would happen one day here. We pray, whole place would be shaken. We'd say, whoa! You know what you would think? You'd think pastor's got some kind of real connection there. Nope. Nope. I am not elevated any higher than any of you. Remember what it said? These were ordinary, common fishermen. Not seminary trained, no special connection. We're going to see the secret here. They prayed, and the place where they were at was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. The word filled can be uh, taken two ways. I got an empty cup down here. It's the Lord's Supper time. We're going to take and I'm going to fill that. I'm going to just pour right into it, okay? Some people take the idea that when you're filled, that you, you know, you only maybe, imagine your body's hollow and you open up the top and you pour in the Holy Spirit and some only have them to the knees. You know, oh, other people got them to the waist. Oh, they got them up to here. And then there's the guy that's completely full, right? He's filled. That's not the concept here. Concept is like a, a motel. You ever been to a motel where you know, the sign out front said vacancy? Vacancy means there's a room available. If it says no vacancy, then that means that every room is already occupied. Now, even if the sign said no vacancy, could they cram one more person in one of those rooms? Yeah, they could. Get a rollaway bed out. All right? Uh, even when they got an extra person in. Oh, yeah, sleeping bag. We get a little more in. The idea is filled, is it is taking and influencing, occupying every part of that, whatever is being filled. Not that you could just fill it up, it, 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 it's, you got more of it. And the reason why this is so important is the day you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you get the Holy Spirit and you get all that you're ever going to get. He is in you. Your body is his temple. He's inside. Filling means you give him the keys to every room and say, occupy every part of my life. What parts of my life do I have? I have a church life. I go to church. Lord, occupy. Fill me. Control me. 
come in and control me at church. I have a work life. I go to work. Oh, Lord, fill me, control me. Be inside the influencer when I'm at work. I have a social life. I meet with friends. I have an internet life. Fill that, Lord, fill that. Every single compartment in my life, occupy it. And that's the idea here. There is no part of your life that the Lord is off limits. No, this is my private space, Lord. Stay out. But for too many of us, we have our own little room that we say, Lord, you can have all the rest of me, but not this one. It may be as simple as things you watch on TV or watch on the Internet. It may be the way you spend your money that you won't honor the Lord with his tenth. He said, just give me a tenth. I will bless you with so much, but give me a tenth. Just give me a tenth. And you say, no, Lord, you can, you can control everything else, but I'm going to take control of my money. I don't know what it is for you. For somebody who says, yeah, Lord, I, I'm saved, but uh, I don't want to be baptized. Be baptized by immersion. Uh, you can control every part of my life. You can, you can be the Lord of it, but uh, I'm going to be in control here. No, that's not it. They gave everything over to the Lord. They prayed. The place was shaken. They'd given everything over to the Holy Spirit. And this is what happened. They spoke the word of God. Here's my word. Boldly. They had great boldness. They were, the, the Jewish culture was trying to shut down the Christian culture. But God gave them the boldness. The boldness. The boldness. Don't you wish you had that kind of boldness? Come on, I do. I wish I could everywhere, all the time, just be bold. Just be bold for Jesus. Don't you wish you could be bold like John Paul Jones when it's the most dire, desperate moment, have the boldness to say, God is going to sustain me and get me through. <laughs> don't you wish you had that kind of boldness? Or like Peter, I don't care what you say. Jesus rose from the dead and I'm proclaiming him no matter what. You, you, no matter, you can incarcerate me, you can crucify me. In fact, later when he is crucified, he says, please crucify me upside down. I am not worthy to be crucified like Jesus was crucified. Boldness, boldness, even in his death, boldness. That kind of boldness is found in that powerful name of Jesus. You got to know Jesus. You got to know Jesus. It's in the healing name of Jesus. You got to know that, that Jesus can do anything Jesus wants at any time he wants to do it. And the saving name of Jesus. Wow. I don't know if you noticed, but the flags of allegiance have just changed. You're not going to find the boldness you need from the American flag. Sorry. You're going to find the boldness you need from the Lord of the Christian flag, Jesus Christ. He will give you boldness. Boldness, boldness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for those who have had patriotic boldness like John Paul Jones. We're thankful, Lord, for those who have had Christian boldness like Peter and John and the other disciples. We know, Lord, that they didn't have such boldness until the Holy Spirit was given at the day of Pentecost. Everything changed. Lord, we know we have the same Holy Spirit that they had, the spirit of boldness. We need to be filled, O oh Lord, which means we need to give you the keys to every compartment in our lives. Say, Lord, move in, influence, dominate, control me. When we are controlled by you, Lord, and we surrender our will, we yield to you. You will make us bold, bold in our faith, bold in our speech, bold for our Christ, bold for salvation. You will make us bold. Lord, we want that mega boldness. We want that great boldness. We surrender today, Lord, our lives to you. Make us bold, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It's time for the Lord's Supper, and as we <clears throat> celebrate the Lord's Supper, I just want to remind you of the two elements. There's the bread, and the scripture said, this is my body which is broken for you.